1958, Nathan Pritikin was diagnosed with ischemic heart disease based on his EKG response to a stress test. Shortly after that, he was informed that he had a malignant lymphoma, a hairy cell leukemia. Of course, in those days, there was no treatment for heart disease and no treatment for cancer. Not being content to sit around and die, Mr. Pritikin turned to the literature. He wanted to find out what societies around the world were doing where they weren't having epidemic of heart disease and cancer like we were having and are having in this country today. And he found two characteristics. First of all, they were consuming a very low fat natural food diet with very limited amounts of animal protein. And secondly, they were very physically active. He adopted that lifestyle, and within a couple of years, his EKG response to a stress test was normalized, and his lymphoma was clearly in remission. He decided to share his ideas with others, and in 1974 published his first book titled Live Longer Now. And he then opened the first Pritikin Longevity Center in 1975, where people could come for three weeks to learn the Pritikin lifestyle. In those early days, Mr. Pritikin was known for his comments that following his program, one could reduce their cholesterol and triglycerides by 25%. Coronary patients could relieve their angina, could avoid bypass surgery, and patients with diabetes or hypertension could control their diseases without the use of drugs. Most people in the medical community thought he was a quack and there was no way that any diet and exercise program could achieve those goals. In 1978, I was offered a position as a consultant to design and to supervise an exercise program when the Longevity Center was moved from Santa Barbara down to Los Angeles. I accepted the position with the understanding that they wouldn't use my name or university affiliation in any of their written material because at that time my appointment was in thoracic surgery. Well, it didn't take long before I began to realize that Mr. Pritikin might be right, and so I started to collect data for publication. I published my first paper in 1981, and at that point decided to focus my entire research program at UCLA to study diet, exercise, and disease with an emphasis on the Pritikin program. To date, we published more than 100 research papers in journals including the New England Journal, Circulation, Hypertension, and Diabetes Care. So what is the Pritikin program? It has three pillars. Exercise, which is consistent with the AHA ACSM guidelines. The Pritikin Eating Plan, which is a natural food diet, which focuses on grains, fruits, and vegetables with very limited amounts of animal protein resulting in a diet which has 10 to 15 percent of calories from fat, less than 100 milligrams of cholesterol a day, and less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium. And the third pillar is education. Mr. Pritikin always believed that you had to educate people as to why they needed to make such a dramatic change in their lifestyle. So can the Pritikin program replace drugs for the control of hypertension, as Mr. Pritikin claimed? To date, we've published seven papers with hypertensive patients' data included. When we were asked to write a review for the Journal of Applied Physiology, Dr. Roberts did a meta-analysis and combined all of the data to end up with an N of over a thousand subjects. As you can see, there were significant reductions in both systolic and diastolic pressures, but more importantly was the fact that more than half of those that came to the program taking drugs went home drug-free. Can the Pritikin program replace drugs to control type 2 diabetes? In 1994, we published this paper in Diabetes Care and we titled it Diet and Exercise in the Treatment of NIDDM, which is what diabetes was referred to in those years. The need for early emphasis, and we gave it that need for early emphasis based strictly on the results that we obtained. As you can see, of the 240 people who came to the center, 
mostly newly diagnosed diabetics. There was a significant drop in their fasting glucose from 160 down to 125, and all but five responded well. There were five that ultimately had to be placed on medicine. Those that were on oral agents, many of them were able to discontinue the medicine and those that were on insulin didn't fare nearly as well. So it's obvious that you need to start the lifestyle change immediately as opposed to relying on drugs to control high levels of glucose. When we did this study, the only thing that was known about diabetics was the fact that they were insulin resistant, especially in skeletal muscle. However, since then, we've now learned that Type 2 diabetes is associated with an actual decrease in the beta cell mass as well as beta cell dysfunction. And those are associated with increased amount of inflammation in the pancreas, particularly in the beta cells, amylin deposits, and increased leptin. So we decided to look at some of these factors in relationship to the Pritikin program. As you can see, in just two weeks of Pritikin, there was a dramatic reduction in insulin levels, indicating a decrease in the insulin resistance. There's a decrease in the amylin, as well as a decrease in leptin. So these results would suggest a decreased risk for the development of type 2 diabetes. Can the Pritikin program lower lipids by 25%? This is the largest study we've done. There's data from over 4,500 individuals. In just three weeks at the Pritikin Center, the average drop in total in LDL cholesterol was 23%. There was a small drop in the HDL, and triglycerides dropped by 33%. The biggest problem I had in publishing David, lipid data from Pritikin was trying to explain that small drop in the HDL. I'll come back to HDL in just a moment. Now, if we compare the Pritikin results with the National Cholesterol Educational Program, 30% fat calorie diet, you can see that there's a dramatic difference and Pritikin in every instance is far superior. Even people taking statins respond well to the Pritikin program. In the 90s, we noticed that a lot of people coming to Pritikin already taking their statin drugs still achieve significant drops in their cholesterol. So I went through the medical records and I found out what their cholesterol level was before they started on the statin, and that's the red bar. And as you can see, when they took the statin drug, they got about a 20% drop in their cholesterol. Now without changing their drug one bit, three weeks of Pritikin, resulted in another 19% drop in their cholesterol levels. And of course, many of these people could now discontinue their statins. They didn't need statins. What they needed was appropriate dietary advice. In 2005, our colleagues in the atherosclerosis lab at UCLA published a paper regarding the impact of HDL. And they pointed out that HDL is not always protective, and they called the situation, the double jeopardy of HDL. And what they concluded was that HDL structure and function may be more important than the absolute HDL cholesterol levels in predicting risk for cardiovascular disease. So we obtained blood samples from 10 men who came to the Pritikin Center that had metabolic syndrome. And we sent the samples over to the atherosclerosis lab. They isolated the HDL and then in their standard LDL mixture measured the monocyte chemoattracted activity, a measure of inflammation. And they found out when they added the HDL from the men with metabolic syndrome, there was more monocyte chemoattracted activity indicating a pro-inflammatory state. Even though as they went through the Pritikin program there was a slight drop in the total amount of HDL. As you can see, the HDL was converted to an anti-inflammatory state, so enhancing the functional capacity of HDL and providing more protection. Can the Pritikin program replace bypass surgery, as Mr. Pritikin suggested? When the program moved from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles, I went through the medical records 
and I identified 64 patients who met two criteria. Number one, they had to have an angiogram documenting their coronary disease. And number two, they had to have a recommendation for their physician for bypass surgery. We found a total of 64 that met those two criteria. 80% of them had angina, 59% had had prior heart attacks. So this really was a very sick group of cardiac patients that decided to try Pritikin instead of the bypass surgery. Five years after they left the program, 81% still had not had their bypass. 6% had new infarctions, and there were only 6% deaths, and of that 6% deaths, only two were directly correlated to their coronary artery disease. Now we can compare those results with the VA coronary bypass study that was done at about the same period of time. And in their five-year follow-up, they found that the patients who had actually undergone bypass had a 17% mortality, almost three times the Pritikin mortality, and those that were managed by standard medical care had a 38% mortality, more than six times the Pritikin mortality. So apparently Mr. Pritikin was right when he predicted that his program could reduce the need for bypass surgery. The question then is why did Pritikin coronary patients do so well? Well, we think that the primary reason is there's a development of what we call plaque stabilization. We know when most people have a heart attack, they have it because of the cholesterol plaque rupturing and a large blood clot forming. So if you can stabilize the plaque and prevent it from rupturing, you can prevent the heart attack. And you can do that by reducing inflammation and reducing the activation of matrix metalloprotease number nine, which is an enzyme found in the artery wall which degrades the fibrous plaque. So we started to look at factors related to inflammation. In our first studies, we looked at high sensitivity CRP as a general marker for inflammation. And as you can see in this study here in children, in just two weeks at the Pritikin program, there was a 45% reduction in inflammation and there's a 50% reduction in the MMP9. So at this point in time, we decided that we needed to focus our research efforts on the understanding better how the Pritikin program affects overall inflammation. So at this point, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Roberts because he's been responsible for the studies that we've done recently on inflammation. Inflammation has been linked to a variety of chronic diseases including obesity, atherosclerosis, diabetes, certain forms of cancer, and many other health problems. For example, at UC San Diego, Dr. Jerry Olewski's laboratory has been a pioneer in investigating the role of fatty acids in inflammation. First, they've taken a look at the role of saturated fatty acids on pro-inflammatory cytokines, specifically mediated by activating toll-like receptors, which activate the NF-kappa B pathway leading to the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Second, they've taken a look at the relationship between the activation of these pathways in response to omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids, by activating the GPR120 receptor, not only inhibit the NF-kappa B pathway, but also activate the expression of anti-inflammatory cytokines. In a recent publication, we took a look at the effects of the Pritikin lifestyle intervention on pro-inflammatory cytokines in a group of obese children. What we noted was a significant reduction in IL-6, IL-8, and TNF in response to two weeks of intensive lifestyle modification. In addition, when we took a look at the correlation between these saturated fatty acid species that are commonly associated with inflammation and these inflammatory markers of IL-6, IL-8, and TNF, we saw significant positive correlations. In addition, when we correlated omega-3 fatty acids with these same pro-inflammatory cytokines, we saw inverse relationships. Furthermore, we recently completed a study where we tried to determine the effects of the Pritikin intervention in not only obese, but also in lean children. The reason for this is based upon the current dogma which suggests that obesity and weight loss are the key primary factors that determine the effectiveness of lifestyle intervention. 
when we took a look at the effects of two weeks of lifestyle modification in children who were both obese and lean, both groups responded identically to the intervention in terms of the effects on a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as metabolic markers. This slide shows the steps that are thought to be involved in the development and progression of atherosclerosis. We've already talked about a couple of these, the LDL cholesterol and the inflammatory cytokines. We've actually studied the Pritikin program in relationship to all seven of these stages and have shown improvement, indicating the Pritikin program should be very effective for the prevention and the arresting of atherosclerosis. This is a summary slide of the last 35 years of my work at UCLA, and it describes all of the diseases we've studied in relationship to the Pritikin program. Two things are obvious. First of all, from the arrows flying in every which direction, there's a lot of interaction between the various diseases. But the bottom line is very clear. In most cases, these diseases that are so common in our society are a direct result of our lifestyles. A lack of physical activity combined with a high fat refined sugar diet. So in conclusion, the Pritikin program is effective for treating many of the risk factors associated with coronary disease, including hyperlipidemia, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, especially in the early stages, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, and chronic inflammation. And finally, the Pritikin program is effective for the treatment of patients with documented coronary disease, reducing the need for bypass surgery.